Hello and welcome again to the first webinar in our series on the rise of Big Meat. Um, I am Colleen Borgendale, uh, the Communications Manager and Creative Director at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, um, uh, otherwise known as ITP. And um, I'm going <clears throat> to be, run be running the webinar. Uh, so I just want to give you a couple uh, housekeeping notes before we get started. You, um, I'd like to draw your attention to the Zoom webinar control panel. And as you can see on the screen, um, throughout the webinar, you are able to submit your questions to our presenters by typing them into the Q&A box located within the panel. So we have them in all in one place um, and can make sure that we <clears throat> get to them at the end. Um, so you're gonna submit at the Q&A and then select the send button. After our three presenters are finished, we will have our Q&A session and we'll try to get to as many questions as time allows. So please send your questions in as they come to you um, and they are being collected somewhere. Um, finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on ITP's website at itp.org after um, we are done with this webinar and we will also be sending out an email um, in a follow or a link in a follow-up email. So let's get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm trying to start my video, and I think I can now. Good morning. Uh, my name is Juliette Mugeot. I'm Executive Director of the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, welcome to our webinar this morning. Uh, for 30 years, IATP has undertaken research and analysis and advocacy working for agriculture and trade systems that are good for farmers, good for food system workers, good for the environment, and good for social justice. Um, we are headquartered here in Minneapolis. We have offices in Washington, D.C. and in Berlin, Germany. Uh, there's a great deal to say about the global meat complex, the corporations that run it, and the governments that should be regulating it. Our panel is going to keep this larger context in mind as we talk, focus in on a new report um, that's very specific, the rise of big meat in Brazil. The report stems from a two-year process with our partners in Brazil, FASE, Rebrip, and the Heinrich Boll Foundation Brazil. In 2015, FASE hosted a meeting bringing together trade unions, peasant movements, researchers, NGOs in Brazil, and others working on the global meat complex from IATP and elsewhere. Out of that process came a Portuguese report in 2015 written by Sergio Sussinger that introduced many of the issues in this updated and more in-depth report that we are launching today. This report has been produced in English for an international audience. We have three exceptional panelists uh, joining us this morning. They are Shafali Sharma, who I have the privilege of working with here at the at IATP. Shafali is head, uh, is director of IATP Europe based in Berlin and is also our lead researcher and campaigner on the global meat complex. Andre Campos from Reporter Brazil and Marine Santos from the Heinrich Boll Foundation, and I'll give a little bit longer introduction to them uh, as they speak. Um, we'll be hearing from all three panelists. Um, as Colleen said, please do submit your questions as they come to you. We have, uh, I'm having, being helped here by uh, Tara Ritter in our office who's going to organize them and hopefully we'll be able to give them to you in an organized and thoughtful manner. Thank you for patience with any technical uh, glitches that we may have. Um, and we will move on from here. Um, Shafali um, is our first speaker. Um, Shafali has been working on international governance issues of many kinds uh, for more than two decades. She, she wrote this morning with an exclamation mark and a question mark. Um, uh, and Shafali, I'll just hand it right over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, great to be here. Let me see if this will work. 
Voila, can you guys see that? Great. So yes, we are very excited about launching this report. It's been, as uh, Juliet said, in the making for the last two years. Um, and our Brazilian uh, colleagues, I'm sure, are also excited that it's, it's finally out. But the, the fact is that we had to keep updating it because so much has changed and so much keeps changing, particularly this year with JBS. Um, which is the biggest meat producer in the world and um, is a Brazilian organization, uh, a Bra Brazilian corporation. And Maureen will talk a lot more about that um, as the third panelist, but let me get started. So why did we um, focus on Brazil? We started out with China a few years ago. We, did, we produced four reports on the global meat complex, who are the companies and why are they growing in China and outside of China? And one of the reports we produced was called The Need for Feed, um, which obviously took us to Brazil and to Argentina. Um, uh, we saw soy exports, which has been written about quite a bit, um, exponentially increase from Brazil. Uh, the European Union has been a, a very big importer of Brazilian soy, but uh, China has pretty much dwarfed the EU since. Uh, but they, those two continue to be uh, the biggest ex, um, imp importers. Uh, so we decided we wanted a, a much more in-depth look at Brazil and what has been happening. And what we found, of course, is that Brazil is central to the global meat complex. Uh, at least, uh, not least because uh, the Brazilian government has invested quite a bit in developing these um, national champions. And you can see uh, Brazil in the last few years has become the, the leading exporter in the world of poultry, the leading exporter in the world of beef, the leading exporter in the world of soybeans, and number two in maize, and number four in pork. And uh, competing with the United States, of course, both in terms of exports, but also in terms of production. It's uh, number two in uh, poultry production, in beef, in soybeans, number three in maize, and number four in pork. So I mentioned about uh, national champions. And what's important to understand is that, in, that this policy was initiated by the Brazilian government between 2007 and 2013 where they decided to single out uh, a certain set of corporations that they thought would bring them revenue by developing their export potential. So public money, uh, including from the Brazilian National Development Bank, BNDES, uh, went into um, creating these national champions, and I write international champions, because as you can see, uh, that strategy worked very well, uh, almost too well for these corporations. The JBS's uh, increase in food sales over the last six years has increased by uh, 195%. Um, and uh, yeah, so, oops. My uh, keyboard seems to be frozen. Hold on one second. Sorry guys, I'm trying to figure out why my computer. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, so this chart we compiled um, from Food Engineering Magazine's top 100 food and beverage companies. And we looked at all of the meat processors in the world. And you can see that the national champions policy basically resulted in JBS uh, far exceeding Tyson and Cargill. Um, at least we, we monitored it from uh, 2011, but this is, uh, you know, they, you can see the growth is just phenomenal. I can show you the graph here. Uh, they far surpass uh, Tyson and Cargill. And the top three, of course, are, you know, much uh, more profitable than even number four and five. And, of course, the top ten themselves are, um, you know, pretty significant um, in terms of shaping the global trade in, in meat. And BRF actually was founded by the merger of two Brazilian uh, corporations uh, and has specialized in poultry. But you can see that BRF goes from number nine in 2011 to number four in 2012 and stays up there. Um, 
and then in the last two years has gone to n number five and Marfrig is also there in the top 10. So what has, what has the impact been in, and I'm very pleased to have Andre Campo here. He, uh, one of the issues that we really focused on in this report is about human rights and he's going to talk about that. But I want to flag some of the other issues that we bring up in the report. And one of them is that as this exponential growth happened, of course, there was a soy moratorium. There have been uh, zero deforestation agreements in terms of cattle. And this study uh, conducted by Dibs um, et al. from uh, did ranchers and slaughterhouses respond to zero deforestation agreements in the Brazilian Amazon? I found the study very useful. This map shows uh, where the deforestation agreements are, the zero deforestation agreements are, and you can see the deforestation around those um, areas. And what's happened in the last two years is that uh, while Brazil was dramatically reducing its deforestation rate, although deforestation continues to climb, uh, it has reversed that trend in the last few years. Um, and we, uh, we believe that this has in part to do with the, the rising exports that Brazil has and the rising production in Brazil as well, in part. Um, so you can see that what happens, uh, why does deforestation continue in spite of zero, zero deforestation agreements? Yes, they've been successful to some degree, but you can see that uh, with laundering and leakage, so, you, so the non-regulated um, operations and ranches uh, supply to non-compliant, uh, non-compliant, well, okay, sorry. So these non-regulated uh, corporations get their supplies from these um, ranches and then it's leaked to the slaughterhouse that is also not compliant. And the same thing with illegal calving ranches. Uh, you can see that they basically circumvent um, that, uh, that chain that is supposed to be monitored. So you can then create, and some of them get funneled into uh, the laundering scheme whereby the non-compliant supply to the compliant supplying ranch and then and then forward their uh, meat basically and cows to the slaughterhouse that is compliant what has been the impact the impact has been deforestation disruption of critical weather uh, patterns not just for the amazon but for the whole region and uh, eventually for our planet and what that means, and of course, drought. So this is uh, a phenomenon uh, known as the flying rivers of Amazon. Uh, there is so much evaporation that's taking place in the Amazon on, on a daily basis. And all of that turns into clouds in the summertime and moves west. And then what you see is this then descends down from the north and brings rains to the south in um, in the region. This is the whole, uh, I like this map because it shows just the amazing web of tributaries that the Amazon has and how much uh, these weather patterns are really critical for the whole ecosystem. What we've seen in the last two decades is while there has been uh, a lot of focus on the Amazon, the expansion has been taking place in this area in the Cerrado. And what we will be seeing is much more also expansion as even poultry operations have uh, become, you know, very, have been increasing at a, at a very fast pace uh, in an area called Mapitoba in English because of this region, Maranhão, Piau, uh, Bahia, sorry. Uh, Andre with my Portuguese, but, uh, and, and Tocantin, Tocantins. Um, this area is also gonna be uh, affected with this expansion and continues to expand both in terms of feed and cattle. And this in the last, uh, basically since 2014, uh, Brazilians uh, in Sao Paulo and elsewhere have been facing drought. Uh, this has continued over the last many years and in part, this is because the this flying river system has become disrupted. And so this should be a cause of serious concern, obviously, uh, for Brazil. Uh, we're talking about drought here. And uh, what this says is, and, and it's interesting because I spoke to somebody from the European um, Parliament yesterday, and they were asking me whether uh, we think that 
the efforts that we made in the 80s and 90s to save the Amazon, whether we need to again start talking about that because basically this region is such an important region for climate regulation as well, not just for Brazil, but also for the whole planet. And this, I wanted to, I wanted to leave off with um, uh, this, these set of graphics that we produce with grain uh, just before the climate conference. Um, and you can see again, JBS is the largest emitter of the top 20 meat and dairy corporations in the world. Uh, Marfrig is number seven, Minerva, which is a beef processor, number 35, I mean, sorry, is number eight, and BRF is number 11. So these national champions um, are pretty huge global emitters. And this does not obviously let off the hook uh, US corporations like Tyson or Cargill, uh, New Zealand's Fonterra or any of the others. The, the fact is that they're not really national anymore, they're international. But the, the bigger point here is unless we start to do something about the global nature of this growth, um, what we will see is that if we do want to get to a two degree or a 1.5 degree world, without doing anything about this global meat complex, um, we basically are headed towards a, a climate catastrophe. So, and uh, if that doesn't depress you guys, I just wanted to share one more slide, which talks about the next 10 years and the growth that is foreseen in Brazil in terms of exports and consumption. And according to the OECD FAO outlook last year, basically uh, they're predicting a 41% increase in, in, in exports of poultry, a 39% increase in exports of, of, of beef, a 29% increase of pork, 33% increase of soy. Um, we need to put back in those numbers on maize uh, and 40% and increase in terms of production, which obviously is also linked to the growth in exports, um, which both for the, for the production at home, uh, for the meat they're producing and exporting. So is it all too late? Uh, are we basically saying, well, you know, um, there's, no, there's no point no, I, I absolutely, and IATP does not think that at all. I think um, we believe that there are, are very um, feasible solutions, but they require political will. And so we do need to redirect um, funding, public funds, from this global complex into regenerating local food systems, reinvesting in them. We definitely need to regulate the global meat complex. We need to... Uh, Without doing that, we are not gonna be able to actually reduce uh, meat consumption and certainly not of industrial meat uh, production, which is what we think is causing all these problems. And let's regenerate a new, uh, uh, the food system that we want uh, for local communities and for the planet. Thanks. This is Juliet. Thanks very much, um, um, Shafali. Uh, I wanted to let you know that um, that the information on uh, GHG um, releases from meat uh, is available. We will also be trying to make sure that PDFs of our slides are available. Some of you have been asking about that. And we will be releasing with some partners a full uh, in-depth report regarding the GHG emissions probably in April. I'm trying to start my video here, but I'm unable to do so. So I, you can, you can, ah, now I might be able to. No, we have a, a little bit of a glitch, but I'm sure you can hear me. Our next presenter is Andre Campos. Andre is a journalist, researcher, and project coordinator working since 2006 in several initiatives from Reporter Brazil. Much of his work is linked to exposing labor issues and human rights abuses related to the supply chain of multinational companies. He conducted several investigations about the meat sector in his company, uh, looking at different supply chains, and was able to uncover a startling percentage of um, released slaves uh, from, uh, um, from the meat industry. And he's going to be speaking to this very uh, important and disturbing aspect of the meat industry. 
Um, Andre. Hi, Juliet. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm trying to connect my video here. Just a second. Okay. All right. So, uh, as Juliet said, I'm part of a Brazilian NGO, Reporter Brazil, who researches human rights here. We do a lot of research and communication journalism about, uh, particularly about modern slavery in our country. And uh, when we talk about modern slavery in Brazil, uh, we have to just to keep in mind that the meat sector is a key sector in terms of violations. And uh, for you just to have an idea, how, uh, we have here in Brazil since 95, uh, the, the, the official recognition, recognition of the government that does modern slave does exist in Brazil. And from this date, a group, an inspection group was created to rescue workers in farms in Brazil. And then the past uh, 22 years, uh, around 52,000 workers were released in Brazil from modern slavery. And from this 52,000 uh, workers, uh, one third basically were laboring in, in cattle farms, in cattle ranches. And cattle ranch activity is the single one with more, the higher number of freed workers uh, in this kind of situation in Brazil. And of course, this number, uh, we are talking about 17,000 freed workers in the past 20 years. This number does not represent the total amount of the problem uh, because not, not every situation that is reported to the government is actually inspected on the field. So it's a higher problem than the 17,000 guys released. And I'm just sharing with you here just uh, a picture. Uh, when we think about the uh, cattle ranch, usually this is the kind of worker that we have in mind that is the, the cowboy, uh, we call it the vaquero here in Brazil. And, uh, but actually the guy that uh, usually it's uh, subjected to uh, modern slavery in Brazil is, is, is another uh, type of worker, N not this one. We, and a worker that usually is kind of invisible to, uh, to the population. I'm trying just to make the PowerPoint presentation too. Okay. This is the kind of worker that is also in a cattle ranch um, farm that is usually freed from modern slavery. Uh, this picture represents, in fact, a, a group of guys that were freed in a government operation. They were here building fences. Uh, they're workers that are usually uh, employed in maintenance jobs, uh, preparation for new areas to receive the cattle, and for example, just uh, ripping off roots from the ground, uh, cutting trees also. Uh, here we have another picture that shows, this is actually a picture that was taken in a, in a farm uh, where workers were released and uh, they were you know, making, uh, were part of the deforestation team to, to, to just create a new cattle farm in the Amazon region here. This is very common. Uh, much of the slave labor cases that we have in the cattle ranch activity, they are linked to deforestation. So this, do, this crimes, uh, modern slavery and illegal deforestation, uh, quite often they come together. This is a very common thing in, in, in Brazil. And uh, who is this, uh, this worker? The, the worker that is subjected to modern slavery in cattle farms. Usually it's a uh, young, poor, uh, male migrant worker, okay? He's uh, coming from the poorer regions in Brazil. He's, uh, he's, uh, he, he's uh, you have uh, in Brazil, this very uh, typical figure in the rural areas, which is 
we call the gato, but uh, it will be something like uh, a coyote, something like this, let's say. Uh, he, he goes to a particular region in Brazil where you have a lot of poor workers and uh, then he announces a, a job in a farm many times thousands of kilometers away, for example, in the Amazon region saying that they have they need uh, a certain number of workers for around six eight nine months just to prepare some land that is going to receive a pasture he promises uh, payments and describe the conditions and quite often the workers have to decide uh, in a short time if they are going to accept this or not a group is formed and the group is brought to the farm and quite often when they came to the farm, uh, the situation is that uh, it's not like the one that was described during the recruitment. For example, this is uh, where workers, freed workers were leaving uh, in a raid of the, 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 the authorities that found modern slavery in a cattle farm. Typical, uh, is, that's, that's very common, you know, housing conditions in these places where these workers stay while they are doing this, this, this short-term jobs for a few months in, in these farms. Look how it is inside. You don't have uh, anything, uh, not uh, running water, not uh, uh, facilities to, to just to put your stuff uh, or, or, or even uh, how to storage food in a health and safety way. It's just, uh, you know, rudimentary shelters, very different in inhumane conditions. Here are, you see uh, it's also in, a, in a, an operation uh, that feed workers, the kind of water that's provided, lack of uh, protection equipment, uh, also an issue. And many times these workers, uh, when they got to these places, they, they are obliged to, to to buy things that supposedly they should receive for free from the employer. For example, protect, protective gears. And uh, many times they are very isolated in these farms because you have to keep in mind that we are talking about farms uh, inside of the Amazon. Many times the nearest city is just 400 kilometers away, 500 kilometers away. So you get to the place that uh, there are conditions and you have the, the, the geographic situation stops you to, to uh, leave the job. How, how are you going to leave this place? Uh, you have no, no way, there's no buses coming for you to take it, nothing like this. And uh, you, you have to buy things, uh, food, uh, equipments, many times from the employers under prices that are not uh, the prices uh, uh, that are the ones that are offered in the market, higher prices. And uh, this quite often leads to a, a debt bondage uh, relationship. This is a very common thing to find in these farms. Uh, the notepad with the debts, where the, 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 the local manager of the farm keeps track of how much all these workers are in debt with the, the farm for food or other things and how much they still need to work just to pay out this these debts and uh, here in some situations of course this is this is an extreme situation it's not always like this but in, you have even extreme situations where this modern slavery scenario leads to physical threats and violence here it's a case of a worker who was you know uh, marched with hot iron cattle hot iron for being compl having complained uh, about not receiving the payments uh, delayed payments and uh, this, this worker actually ran away from the farm and uh, reported the situation to the authorities and the authorities get to this farm and as a result uh, you ha you ha had uh, 35 workers being released from modern slavery uh, in this particular case here and uh this is a this is a, this is a cattle range activity uh, this is how how 
how slavery can can appear in the in, in the sector but when we go to the chicken farms there is also a, a group of workers that uh, very usually are, are are subjected to to poor working conditions and in ex extreme situations not as often as the cattle ranch but also you have some extreme situations that are considered modern slavery according to the brazilian legislation uh we are we are talking about uh, the poultry catchers uh, that's how we call them here uh, it, it's also a type of work that many people doesn't even know that exists but uh, uh, when you when you go to a chicken farm uh, you have to have a guide to put the chickens on boxes and then to transport the chickens to the slaughterhouse this type of work is done they usually by uh, outsourced workers uh, they are hired by companies that are hired self by the meat packing plants and this tra transportation companies are in charge of hiring the workers that are going to do this kind of job here in brazil and uh, how it works you go uh, you have a, a team of workers usually 10 to 12 uh, they 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 get in a van in a particular time of the day and they go to a one one chicken farm they just loaded all the chickens in the boxes and the, then the boxes on the the, the on the, the the trucks and they do just uh, amazing things this is like a 10,000 50,000 uh, chickens uh, loaded in uh, in one hour something like this and for, they go in one day of work from one farm to the other uh, and many times to five six seven farms in just one single day of work and farms that are not necessarily close to each other and one thing that is very common and problematic in this activity is just very very long and excessive hours working hours you have a uh, it's common it happens that these workers leave in the morning and just go uh catching chicken for uh, 14 hours 16 hours 18 hours just you know eating in the car many times you sleep in the car and you have reports and even of situations that they just go on that on that dynamics for two days and three days and it's very you never know exactly when you're going to start to work and when you're going to come back so it's a guy who never knows when he's going to sleep it's not very you know well organized uh agenda working agenda and uh what happens is that these workers also have a lot of health issues because it's a very tough job taking these boxes with 15 chickens inside 20 kilos something like this just loading in the trucks put up in the trucks this, this guys usually doesn't have a, a long uh, and a physical capacity of doing this kind of work which is in fact the, the kind of work it's, that is available for them. Again, we're talking about the same uh, type of worker, uh, poor, work, poor, poor men's, young men's with poor education. And many times, uh, uh, and, and the majority of them that identify themselves as black people are mixed race people. That's the profile of, of the workers. And, uh, you know, this, this happens 24 hours a day it goes on uh, during the this one is shoot uh, 3 a.m something like this you have groups doing this because the slaughterhouse operates 24 hours a day so you have to deliver chickens 24 hours a day all, all day long there are groups catching uh, chickens in some form or uh, in some place and uh, i've just asked want to mention here very briefly that we also have workers wishes when we in the meat industry when we talk about the 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 industrial plants these workers uh, also face a lot of accidents and, and repetitive strain injuries in this environment and uh, when we talk about the contract farms that we have in the chicken farms usually small uh, familiar farms 
uh, the, the, the scenario is not that much different when we compare with, uh, with uh, other places uh, in, in the world. Uh, you, they, they don't know how much they are going to receive by the, the animals. Uh, many, 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 many of them are in debt uh, with banks uh, and, uh, and running out of business and uh, having a hard time just to make a living from this activity. Uh, and, and the uh, payment models that are imposed by the industrial industrial uh, buyers, and uh, I, I, it's important to take in mind that these problems. When we talk, I'm just uh, pointing out here uh, a recent story that uh, the Guardian made with, with the help of Report Brazil in partnership with Report Brazil, showing how those problems, uh, modern slavery in cattle farms. Uh, they, they, they are linked to international markets. This is not something that is local and just stays on the local market. You have this uh, also in, uh, in, in, in meat, beef that is going to be exported uh, to, to big brands in, in other countries. And uh, the same goes for chicken. Uh, we, we did have already in Brazil cases of modern slavery linked to this both big two names of the, the chicken industry, BRF and JBS, which are companies supplying for fast food companies. Uh, you have names like KFC, Subway are part of the supply chain. So it's, it's, it's really a global issue when you think about this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you've been listening to um, Andre Campos, a, a journalist in Brazil uh, who, who does work with Reporter Brazil, whose work has been uncovering um, the terrible conditions of modern slavery associated with the meat sector in Brazil. And as he points out very importantly, uh, this is meat that, that uh, is part of the global meat complex and, and moves on the global market as well as the inputs for that meat. Our next presenter is uh, Maureen Santos. She's the pro Program Coordinator for Environmental and Social Justice for the Heinrich Boll Foundation in Brazil. In the past 10 years, she worked for the organization FASE in basic training, popular education, and building networks and coalitions in the areas of international trade, regional integration, as well as environmental and climate change. For the foundation, she monitors the negotiations of the UNFCCC, in particular the issues of uh, the adaptation and reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation program that we all know is RED. She organized research groups on the high-level panel of food security of the FAO that recently produced a study on climate change and food security. Um, welcome, Maureen, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank 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 you. Maureen, uh, okay. Maureen, this is Colleen. I'm just going to uh, pop in. Are you, do you have your microphone close to you? The sound is just really um, kind of garbled and uh, not, the sound isn't great right now. Okay, so I my video because I can open. Sorry, everyone, for technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Um, do you have a specific microphone that you're using? And not just your computer microphone? Yeah, in the table. Yeah. yeah. But can you, can you hear me better now? Uh, just a little, but it still sounds like the connection is pretty rough. Okay. So I don't know. I wonder if um, can people hear me? <laughs> yes. Yes. 
I wonder if I could explain your slides for you, Maureen, and uh, can you hear me, Maureen? Can you hear me? Yeah, um, so uh, perhaps I could at least try to explain some of them, although maybe Andre, you can also, because <laughs> you're the one who's in Brazil. Um, and so feel free to jump in. And where I uh, deviate a bit, Maureen, perhaps you can put it in the chat function and we could we could try it like this for now, if that's okay. Just because your sound is really broken up. Let me again. Okay. So, um, at least what I see on the slide, uh, the first uh, Brazil beef scandal that took place was this spring in March 2017. In the, in the international press, it was called uh, Operation Weak Flesh, and I guess in Portuguese it was called Carne Fraca. Um, where uh, the top Brazilian meat producers were found uh, to have bribed food safety inspectors to basically get approval for imp exporting rotten meat. And um, we described this in our report in terms of, you know, the, the producers and the producers I'm talking about are JBS, BRF, uh, Marfrig, Minerva, everybody was involved. And, um, and uh, what they did is that they uh, put chemicals in to hide the rotting smell. They put cardboard in there. They put anything they could to basically, quote unquote, beef it up so that it, the meat looked okay. And the response was that the European Union, China, a few other countries uh, temporarily banned uh, imports from Brazil. And the U.S. actually... Uh, had for the first time opened up its uh, markets for uh, unprocessed beef from Brazil in, in 2016, but then closed its borders for that particular meat, not the processed meat like corned beef that uh, Andre talked about, but rather just cuts of meat. Um, those were banned starting June this year. And I guess the latest is that they might reopen that in early next year. So 30 inspectors were fired. Uh, what happened uh, recently, though, is... Yeah? Can you hear me? So I'm better. Yeah, try speaking. Okay, because it, it's more detailed about that. So I only put some, like, bullet points. So I prefer to, if you can explain. Yeah, try. If, and if then if we can't hear you, then... Okay, so if you... So, this is the back question that's kind of like it's like that. Sorry, Maureen, it's still really hard to hear you, unfortunately. Um, perhaps you could write some of these notes that you have. I, I, I don't know how else we can do it. Um, Unless you speak to Andre by phone and Andre speaks to us. <laughs> um, I, would say, I would say let's move on to the Q&A and maybe we can get Maureen on another webinar. Um, for our, everybody who's attending, we are going to be um, having a couple more uh, webinars in this series on the uh, global meat complex. So uh, um, let me let me just finish up, though, the JBS story, because it gets worse um, oh. and, and then we can open it up for okay. for Q&A, which is that um, basically uh, JBS's uh, uh, CEOs, uh, it's a family, right? It's the Batista family and uh, it's Wesley and Joe's Lee and Wesley Batista. They were found uh, to have from the special prosecutor in Brazil were found to have paid over 1,900 bribes in the period of the last 10 years in Brazil uh, to various uh, politicians, including Temer, the current president, um, and obviously all three governments, Lula's, uh, Rousseff's, and Temer's are implicated because the rise of JBS uh, took place in these last um, 10 years. And while they were negotiating a leniency fine in May, they were also in doing insider trading. And that was also subsequently discovered. So they were arrested in September. And at this point, 
um, uh, JBS has had to um, replace the, the their CEO with, and of course they replaced um, these CEOs with none other than their father, who's 84 years old, Jose Batista. So that's the state of play. What I would love to hear, uh, Andre, if you could comment is, how have the Brazilians reacted to this huge scandal? Uh, what has been the sense in Brazil with regards to this meat company, uh, their rise, and you know, because they're the they're the national champions. So, how do Brazilians feel about this? Yeah, it's uh, here in Brazil. This whole JBS uh, drama uh, happened in the last year. It was really one of the things people talked more about it because it involved uh, the the presidency. Uh, what happened in the time of uh, time of the last year is that the the, the Joesley, the owner of JBS, he went to a meeting with the, the president. Uh, he attacked the president uh, allegedly. Uh, to keep bribing some deputies, uh, it's a very hard story. So uh, right now, is uh, from a Brazilian citizen perspective, uh, what they see in this situation, it's a it's a corrupt relation between companies and the government, uh, which is you know, draining in, in many ways the resources that should be using uh, to education and health uh, into corruption schemes. For example, when we talk about JBS, JBS was uh, supported, highly supported by public funds in all these operations to become an international company. And now we know it's clear, crystal clear that this was in linked this all this funding was linked to bribery and uh, to to send money to politicians so it, that that's how uh, how you know crushed all the 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 coherence of these policies of you know creating the national champions in brazil uh, nobody believes in this anymore as something that was created for the brazilians you know for the welfare of the brazilians it's pretty much clear that was uh, something that it, that's in everybody's mind is something that was created just to um, to transfer money to just uh, some groups, specific groups in Brazil. Thank you. Um, back to we're back to Juliette Mijo here at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, and I'd like to. Um, put a few questions to the panel. Um, on chat, we've been asking if people might be able to stay on a little bit, should our questions go over time, because we are running a little bit late, uh, and we will see if we're able to do that. Um, I'd, uh, I'd also like to apologize to Maureen Campos for the technical difficulties, and we look forward to um, sorting that out and having you on another webinar, Maureen. I'm sure that um, we'll be able to do that. Um, I think first I, I, I'd like to um, come to Shafali and ask you a little bit about the deforestation. There's a question about the deforestation agreements that you talked to in the early part of your presentation. The question is, um, what entities negotiate, sign on to, and monitor the zero deforestation agreements, and how much of JBS growth is attributable? attributable to m as including companies in the U.S.? So that's a very good question. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, these agreements can be signed between uh, companies and the government or NGOs such as Greenpeace. The agreements stipulate that the meat packers will no longer buy from suppliers that continue to deforest after the agreement. Uh, they also have to register with the Rural Environmental Register in Brazil, which tracks properties through satellite technologies. And I think this is where the whole laundering and leakage issue comes in, right? Because what the researchers found was that 
while registration was high and deforestation uh, around the areas where, that were registered um, went down, there was still deforestation happening because of the circumventing of the, of the monitoring process. Um, and how much of it is attributed to the mergers and acquisitions? That's an excellent question. JBS has by far been the master at mergers and acquisitions in the last 10 years. Um, you know, they're, the, they're one of the, the top four uh, beef processors in the United States that control virtually 80-85% um, of the market. And, and uh, yeah, so, and in Australia and elsewhere, they have a lot of assets. They've been in the process of selling um, a bunch of their assets because of this fine, this $3.2 billion uh, fine that was imposed on them. But it, and they have also cleverly uh, for instance, uh, they own Moy Park, which is a, they owned Moy Park, which is a big um, uh, processing facility in uh, the UK. But what they did is that they sold it to um, uh, Pilgrim's Pride, I believe, which is which is JBS in the United States. So they basically sold their own company to their own company. <laughs> so they've they've been very good at it. And, and, and to be honest, I'm not sure how much all these scandals for JBS has actually impacted their their bottom line. Thank you, Shafali. Um, I'd like to pass it um, over to Andre. And also, um, to make it matter worse, I. I uh, I um Maureen, I, I said the wrong name for you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, um, I uh, would like to take it over to Andre and ask you, Andre, have you yet, this is a question that came in, have you traced the chain of Brazilian meat all the way to the consumer in which countries and who buys the meat? For instance, is it KFC, Subway, et cetera, et cetera? Andre, you have to unmute. Sorry. Okay, yeah. Yes, yes, we have traced back uh, uh, how Brazilian meat gets to the international market in, in projects in the past. Uh, I'll just, just to have an idea uh, about this, I, I'll just post it here in the web chat, in the, in the chat, one special web page that we have created a few years ago uh, this one particular is more about uh, the conditions of the workers in the meat packing plants, but it shows the customers of the, the Brazilian meat in the US, in Europe, uh, and uh, you have to uh, take uh, this as, as a 2013 portrait. This is a very dynamic market. Things are constantly changing, and, uh, but what, what's the scenario today is that Brazilian meat is very important supplying uh, companies all around the world. And, and yes, you, you do have both in chicken and, and in the meat sector, uh, big uh, retailers. Uh, we just show, showed the, the garden story, which is mentioned, for example, Waitrose, Sainsbury, and uh, you have also Tesco is a constant buyer from Brazilian meat. And in the US, you have uh, also supermarkets that, uh, that are selling private label products uh, coming with beef, made with beef from Brazil, corned beef, for example. And uh, here in Brazil, also the multinationals, Walmart, uh, they, they, they of course sell beef from Brazil and JBS, all these big companies, Marfrig. So yes, it's a, you have pretty much uh, much of the big na names in the food industry as part of the supply chain of the Brazilian meat. Thank you, Andre. Um, I'm going to take it back to Shafali, um, uh, jump uh, the subject just a little bit because we've had a number of questions come in regarding the um, contribution of greenhouse gases. Um, by the meat industry. Uh, one of the questions is, what method did you use to calculate the CO2 emissions 
of meat processors. In particular, does this imply the soya production needed for meat feed? And I would paraphrase that a little bit and ask you to explain uh, not just CO2 emissions, but the other emissions that uh, are part of the calculations um, for meat. Yeah, I won't go into too much technical detail here because the methodology is on our um, on our website and in the the link that we provided uh, that I just actually pasted on here for the uh, the grain and IATP and Heinrich Bowl study that we did. There's a detailed methodology explained there, but yes, feed is included in that. And the the main methodology that we used was the one developed by the FAO and ironically also the industry. Um, participated in this um, is called GLEAM, G-L-E-A-M, and um, it takes into account um, basically the various stages of production uh, and including land use, but it does measure emissions intensity. So, and that's, uh, we're coming up with a much bigger report uh, in the spring that will detail uh, a lot more information. These are the infographics that we developed uh, right before the, the climate change conference. Thanks, Shafali. Um, uh, from the from the presentation um, of of Maureen's work, and hopefully we'll have a real presentation from Maureen on another um, uh, webinar. We have the question: What is meat consumption rates like in Brazil? Who eats it, and is it inexpensive? You uh, want to take that one, uh, Andre? Yeah, yeah, uh, yes. Brazil, it's it's a uh, it's a country that consumes a lot of meat, and uh, but it's also a country where a large share of the population is poor, and uh, meat is expensive, right? And uh, especially uh, beef. Uh, so so what what happens today in Brazil in the last years? In the last 20 years, 15 years or so, we have this uh, increase of uh, purchase power of uh, what we call the lower middle class, which is actually a working class, in fact. And a lot of people, you know, millions of people suddenly start to have, you know, more money just to spend with themselves. And you have a rise of, you know, uh, search for meat. Meat is a, is a symbol of uh, social inclusion in Brazil. You know, when you start to have money, you buy meat. You know, it's something that people not necessarily can afford to buy every day. So you have an uh, increase here. And uh, even though Brazilian exports a lot of meat, uh, and especially when we talk about beef, the Brazilian society, it is, it is the large consumer of, of Brazilian uh, beef. Uh, so most of what we produce is consumed here internally, although a very, a very important share is, is supported. And I would just add, um, maybe if I can share my screen, hold on one second. Um, if you look at this slide, uh, it's true that, hang on, I just wanna make sure I'm not missing anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you look at the slide and you look at in particular exports and consumption, and it's true, uh, Brazil has very high levels of consumption. It's one of the, it's on par with the United States and some of the over consuming uh, Western countries uh, like Europe, like the United States, Australia, New Zealand. Um, what but what you do see in the next 10 years is that the, the increase is gonna come from exports. And so of course, consumption will continue to rise as well, but it won't rise as fast as the exports will rise. And so that's, that's a problem. And I think that's something that those of us who are focused on this global meat complex really need to think about, which is what is facilitating this rise of exports? Who is actually eating this meat because the meat companies always come back and say, um, well, this is all about food security and it's about feeding the poor. But as Andre has said, you know, how many of the poor are actually accessing this and what is it that the poor actually need in terms of food security? Um, so it's a very important uh, point in terms of where is the bulk of this land use change 
why is that going to happen in the coming decades in Brazil uh, related to the meat complex? Thank you. Um, we're at time and we're going to extend this Q&A um, session for another five to 10 minutes. Um, we have a number of people uh, coming in with a question that I will paraphrase. I'd like to direct it to you, Andre. And, and that is simply, are there statistics or numbers so that we can understand how many people are engaged in modern slavery in Brazil and what part of that are engaged uh, in the meat industry? Okay, uh, what, what the numbers that we have uh, from the official inspections in Brazil, uh, in the last 20 years, something like this, we had uh, 52,000, I'm just going to write here to have no doubt, uh, workers, workers rescued from modern slavery in Brazil. Uh, that's the total of the workers rescued in any kind of sector. And from this number, something about 17,000, okay, it is people who were laboring in cattle farms. So cattle farms, to, it's, it's around uh, one third of the workers rescued in the last, uh, sorry, I'm just posting the, uh, the numbers for calling. I'm just posting post here for everybody, but 52,000 is the to total rescued workers and 17,000 it's of them were uh, in cattle range. So cattle range is is the the, the, the single sector with the highest prevalence of uh, modern modern slavery in terms of workers freed. All right, no sector has have had more workers freed than than the than the cattle ranges. And uh, of course, when you talk, this number is, is a big number, uh, but uh, you have to take into consideration that it doesn't represent, of course, all the size of the problem, because even the situations that are reported to the authorities, not, uh, not every uh, situation is actually inspected. There's not enough inspectors to do the job. And uh, but also, it's, this is also something important to keep in mind that uh, although the problem is very big and serious, you cannot also think that uh, the majority of the cattle ranches get the extreme situation of, of having slave labor is not like this. The slave labor is a extreme problem that is linked, serious problem, a big problem, but it's linked to a, a, a minority of the producers in Brazil. So generalizations are important also not to, to take in place. You, it's a sector with a lot of working problems, uh, a big, big share, a, a big number of uh, workers rescued, but it's not like um, the majority of cattle ranches have slavery. I think that's also important to put things in the perspective, correct perspective. Thank you, Andre. Um, we have another um, few questions that I'm going to kind of put together into one question and paraphrase. Um, and that is, uh, what, how do you see the importance and role of a solidarity campaign with an international con solidarity campaign with activists in Brazil? Um, some writers wrote in about um, similar situations in Africa, for example, and we have an international audience on the call. So maybe both of you could, uh, Shafali and Andre, could uh, give us some of your thinking on solidarity. Okay, Chefali, you want to go first? No, you uh, you go ahead. And I, I think, yeah, it would be great to hear, you know, what do Brazilians, what do you guys, and uh, I don't know if maybe Maureen can weigh in by chat. <laughs> what do you guys think are the steps necessary to, to have a, a, a real um, solidarity movement to address these, these guys? 
the meat industry in particular in Brazil? Yeah. Well, I think that uh, it is it's it, it, it should not be seen as a as a national problem, uh, Brazilian national problem, since we are talking about an industry that's as we see, it's all connected to all over the world, not only through sourcing, but also through investment. Uh, of course, in many of these companies, they are, they are owned by Brazilians, but you know, the capital, the investments that are making this place, these slaughterhouses to, to grow, and then you have new slaughterhouses, for example, in the Amazon, they rely on investments and public uh, funds from bank, the international banking system. And that's, that's the thing that we have to knowledge to, to, to tackle the issues. And I think we have seen in Brazil some uh, advances in the discussions on how to, to fight the problems. For example, the problem of modern slavery, we do have in Brazil now an inspection and the inspections produces public information uh, about who are the offenders of slave labor. And we have, although the system is far from being perfect, we have companies uh, that are formally committed to try to tackle somehow uh, and move these guys out of their supply chain. And much of this happened because they were you know, pressured by international funders, international uh, consumers, and uh, international buyers. So uh, we have to rely on this sharing of information and, uh, and, and, and rely on people who are buying it, knowing exactly what's happening on the ground and have an agenda of tackling the issue, which is not a naive agenda uh, in terms of just, you know, shutting down uh, the entire sector, uh, but knowing how, how is the size of problem and how to have in, uh, policies to deal with this. And also to, I think that, for example, in Brazil, we have, a, uh, although we have a lot of problems, just the, the fact that I can share with you guys this kind of numbers show that our system uh, of fighting slavery, although very limited, it's producing a model that might be used in other places where you just don't have anything, uh, no type of government uh, inspection looking at this problem, no type of information being produced about it. And I think this is also something that uh, can be, you know, somehow, some way just uh, spread in other places. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andre. Uh, we have a number of questions that we weren't able to get to. Our panelists will review. We'll, we'll have them for our panelists. We will uh, give them to them and um, have them find a way to provide some more answers. Some of them are quite technical, um, related to trade, uh, related to equivalency standards, et cetera, et cetera. But there are others that, um, again, I'd like to paraphrase because there are a number of similar ones that, that have come in. And, and these, um, these questions basically ask, what is the relationship between um, trying to influence the consumption of meat trying to limit the consumption of meat and the importance of tackling this bigger problem uh, through policy. Is it possible to just have people eat less meat without a policy component? Uh, Shafali? Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if I can speak to the Brazilian context, whether, um, Andre, what you think, whether consumers would uh, do this without actually having a policy. Um, so maybe you want to answer that. But what I can say is that uh, it's interesting when I was in Brazil and also in recently there have been announcements by BRF and by, by others about uh, animal welfare because Brazilians care about animal welfare. And their timelines are long and they're saying that, you know, they will take away battery cages and gestation crates for pigs. As, as you guys saw from my presentation, uh, pork production is, is increasing in Brazil. And, uh, but the question that I had for Andre was, you know, but how much do, do uh, Brazilians actually understand that slave labor is also happening? And that, and will these companies actually do what they're saying about animal welfare? I personally don't believe that consumer choice alone is what is going to lead us to uh, lower consumption. Um, 
yes, education needs to happen, but people need to be educated about the impacts both on Brazilians and uh, abroad on what is happening as a result of this, um, you know, explosion in in soy, maize, and meat production. Uh, so, but I, I think policy measures will be necessary. Andre, did Andre, you want to comment? Like to uh, comment on that? Well, uh, I think that. Uh, it's it's a very sensitive and difficult uh, approach, of course. Uh, about the, we, we do have here in Brazil some uh, small, minor, uh, very you know uh, restricted initiatives. For example, during some time, the the mayor city here in São in São Paulo, in São Paulo, which is the biggest city, made a campaign just like Mondays free from meat, don't need meat, at Monday, uh, reduce the consumption. But at the same time, uh, you have to take in mind that we are talking here in Brazil, as in many other parts of the world, about a group of people which is, has always had problems to access meat as, as a, something to part of their daily lives. And now, finally, it's getting more easier and cheaper and possible to do it, uh, to eat it. And, uh, this is this is a audience uh, this is a group of people that uh, see meat not only as a food uh, but is some a social inclusion as i said to campaign uh, there's a lot of limits how you can can campaign to reduce meat in this kind of context and uh, i think that really uh, it's something that it uh, you have to discuss in a very long term uh, in, in, in a, and it doesn't I, I agree with uh, Shefali this is not going to you know be a short term answer for the problems related to to to, to the unsustainable growth of the industry uh, we have it's an import, important component of what we need to do and discuss but it's not going to lead the change I don't think so Thank you so much. Um, we've reached the end of this. Thank you so much to the very the many participants who stayed with us for uh, an extra 15 minutes. Um, we look forward to hearing from you soon. We will. Um, this webinar has been recorded. It will be available um, soon and on our site on the IATP site. And we will send an, a follow up email in the next few days with a link to this webinar. Thank you very much to our presenters, Shafali, uh, Andre, and uh, Maureen. And um, we look forward to the next webinar uh, on this very important subject. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.